Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on disease modifying therapies in multiple sclerosis. I'll be your facilitator today and my name is Peter Butler and Jane Bridgman will be presenting the topic today. In the spirit of reconciliation, MS Limited acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge our gratitude that we share this land today, our sorrow for the costs of that sharing and our hope and belief that together we can shift to a place of equity, justice and partnership. So I'll just give a quick introduction to Jane. She works here at MSL with me. Uh, she's a nurse advisor. She uh, is also a re registered nurse and a MS certified nurse. And I'll now pass you over to Jane to give a further introduction. Thanks, Pete. Uh, yes, so as you said, I am a uh, MS nurse advisor here at MS, and I fill my days speaking with people over the phone and also via email to uh, give them information and support. So today we're going to be taking a deep dive into disease modifying therapies. So a bit of an introduction to the treatments as a whole, looking at how we categorize them to help us break down how many there are, because there's 16 now. So we'll be doing a summary of each one, looking at what to expect if you're going on that medication, an overview of the side effects, and then also some helpful tips, things that I've learned from neurologists, from MS nurses, and also from people living with MS about what worked for them, what didn't, and what they wish they knew when they were going on that medication. We'll also be finishing with a little bit about when to change medication, because you don't necessarily have to stay on one medication forever. And also a few tips on decision making as well, because you may find yourself here because you're needing to make a decision about a treatment. So how is MS treated? Well, there's kind of three main categories. The first one is disease modifying therapy, which is what we're going to be covering today. So that describes medications that are proven to slow the disease progression over time. So it certainly means that the MS will not progress to nearly the state that it would have if you weren't on treatment. It doesn't necessarily mean that the MS won't progress at all, but there's lots of evidence to show that it is effective in that. It will also minimise symptoms to a degree and certainly can prevent symptoms from happening in the future. The other two strategies that we won't be covering today are symptom management. And so that is when we treat each symptom on its merit. So maybe pain medication for pain or a fatigue management program to manage fatigue. There's also the brain healthy lifestyle. So they are lifestyle choices you can make each and every day to support your brain health and maintain cognitive reserve over the long run. That's not something we'll be covering today. Both those two topics have their own webinars. So I encourage you to have a look at those if you're interested. So talking about disease modifying therapies, which can commonly be abbreviated to DMT, they are usually immunosuppressant and they often work the best really at the start of MS. So when people are newly diagnosed, if they start on treatment, as you can see here in the green, the potential range of outcome is actually much more favorable than perhaps if people go on treatment later, which we can see in the gray, or if people don't have access to treatment or choose not to go on treatment, which we can see in the orange. So although these treatments are immunosuppressive and do have some side effects, we can certainly see that there is a huge benefit for people going on these treatments and what they do to the MS over time. So what are we working with? Well, we certainly have had lots come out over the years, but it hasn't always been the case that we've had a lot of treatments to choose from. If you were diagnosed in the 1980s or even the early 1990s, there wasn't a lot to choose from. We can see here in the purple, the injectable therapies came around first. So the interferons, which is the betaferon, Avonex and Rebif, they are all types of interferons, but slightly different. And then also Capaxone, which is separate to an interferon. Capaxone came out earlier at a lower dose that had to be given more frequently. And then in 2004, we gained our first infusion called Tysabri. 
So all the orange bubbles are infusion therapies that you have at hospital. We then gained some oral medications around 2010. They're in the yellow and then continued to get more options as we went through. So you can see also Zimbrita up the top there with an asterisk. That's because it was launched and some people did go on it, but it was withdrawn because of safety concerns. I've also got in the green some news, if you will. So Jelenia and Tysabri were approved for paediatric use. And unfortunately, there are some children or even teenagers that are diagnosed with MS. So that's why that medication was approved. And we can also see that Obagio uh, was no longer made in the brand name. So it's now only available in the generic. And then finally, up the top, we have Vumerity. That is a brand new medication that has been approved by the TGA and is not yet on the PBS. So it's not yet recommended. Uh, sorry, it's not yet subsidised by the PBS, but it has been given a positive recommendation by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. They have recommended it go on the PBS. So as of today, uh, the 23rd of June, it is not on the PBS, but we are expecting that to happen. So we talk about how do we categorise these drugs because there's 16 of them. So how do you get your head around them? Well, they're given in three main forms. So self-injectable drugs, which means you would give them yourself. Uh, most commonly people will be taught how to do them uh, and do them at home themselves. You may also get some support or some assistance from a spouse or a family member or even a carer. Rarely people might go to a medical clinic and get a nurse to give the injection, but mostly people would do them themselves. Then we have oral medications. So you take those um, as either tablets or capsules, and then we have infusions. So the infusions are given in hospital. And then more recently in the last few years, we've seen a, um, an option for some people to have infusions at home. Um, there is one company that offers Ocrimis and Tysabri as infusions at home, um, subsidized by the drug company and also private health insurance. But for the vast majority of people, they'll be having them in hospital. So how well do they work? Well, it's a little bit tricky, but we do break them down into these rough categories because it helps us categorize which is the highly efficacious drugs, which ones are kind of moderate in how well they work, and which ones are low in the um, effectiveness. So often these are how they would be grouped, but it is up for opinion, I suppose. And the other thing to note is that just because all the drugs may be in one category. It doesn't necessarily mean they're on par with each other. So then one might be slightly more effective than the other, but roughly this is how we talk about them. So what that means is that medications in that high category in green are proven to be much more effective and will prevent more damage, I suppose, um, be more effective. So I nearly think of them like as a more effective sunscreen. So maybe an SPF 15 versus an SPF 50, if that makes sense. And what types of MS do they work on? So most commonly people are diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS, about 85% of people. And so most of the drugs we have are actually for relapsing remitting MS. You will see Vimerity with that uh, asterisk again, just to say that it is not yet PBS listed. And interestingly, you'll see Ocrevus twice. That's because it's proven to be beneficial for both relapsing remitting MS and primary progressive, although it is not PBS listed for primary progressive MS. That isn't from lack of trying though. There has been uh, at least one submission to the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee to ask the, the PBS to list this medication, but that was denied. So it is not listed by the PBS. And then for secondary progressive MS, we just have the one, which is Mazent. So before you go on treatments or if you're swapping treatments, what happens? We do lots of tests and some preparation. What those can be can differ. So certainly who your doctor is um, will determine if they have any particular preferences. So some neurologists might do it a tiny bit different or some hospitals, but there is standard recommendations for each drug. 
And then also if you have any pre-existing health conditions or if you're already on any medications as well, and these, doc, um, these medications can only be started by a neurologist. So that's why the neurologist appointment is a, a before treatment thing. Some of these drugs can be re-prescribed by a GP, for example, but they cannot be initiated by a GP. MRIs is always done beforehand and often afterwards as well. We, we do recommend MRIs continuing after you start treatment, looking at blood cell counts and the John Cunningham virus blood test. I'll explain that a little bit later. And often screenings for other health conditions such as tuberculosis, shingles, hepatitis, HIV. That's not because we think you have these conditions, but it's because we want to check and to make sure we know the status of those before we go and give you any immunotherapy. You may be asked what your vaccination history is because they'd like to know, are you up to date with your vaccines or do we need to catch you up on anything before we start? Because when you go on an immunotherapy, it's either going to modify or suppress the immune system and to, for a vaccine to work, your immune system has to process it. So if you are immunosuppressed, a vaccine may not work as well or a live vaccine could pose a potential risk. So sometimes you'll delay treatment to have some vaccines and other times vaccines would not be recommended on treatment, such as live vaccines, but other non-live vaccines, such as the COVID vaccine or the influenza vaccine may be recommended, but at specific timing. So it's always good to check with your treating team, which is your neuro or your MS clinic or your nurse about the timing on vaccines. And then after treatment, We've got those neurologist reviews, MRIs, blood tests, and then also some cancer screenings. That's not because these drugs cause cancer, but because they mess with the immune system a little bit. And we know when we modify or suppress the immune system that there is a theoretical risk that there may be a change to um, your defense systems. So it's recommended that you keep up with the standard screening guidelines. So pap smears, skin checks, mammograms, prostate, those types of things. So we're starting with the medications. Here we start with the interferons. As I said, Avonex, Betaferon, Plegridi and Rebif are all working in the same way. They are all interferons that naturally occur in the body. They're, sorry, versions of something that naturally occurs in the body. And they are in that low effectiveness category. They are dosed at different times. So some of them could be weekly or every second day or fortnightly, and they come in different forms. So a pre-filled injection pen versus a powder and solution, which you would mix yourself. In terms of where they're injected, subcutaneous means into the fat, whereas intramuscular means into the muscle. So what to expect if you're going on an interferon? Well, you'll need to learn how to do the injection. So someone should give you some education and training with that, and then you will take over doing them yourself. And as we said, subcutaneous, that's where the skin is loose and soft. So if you can grab something and pinch it, that's the adipose tissue, that's the fat. And so that's where a subcutaneous injection goes. Now you don't just kind of pick anywhere on the body. There are injection sites that are recommended. So that might be, below the belly button in the little pot belly area, could be the muffin top love handle area, um, and it could be even on the top outer area of the thigh into the fat there, for example. And then with intramuscular, usually it's into some big muscles, so it could be into the quad area. Some of these medications do need to be kept cold, so either keeping it in the fridge at home or using a travel cooler bag if you're going away for the weekend, they are syringes or sharps, so looking at sharps containers. And because they are injectable drugs, where the injection goes in, you might have a little mark or a bruise. Looking at the side effects, most commonly we're looking at flu-like side effects. So after you give yourself the injection, you may feel a little bit unwell afterwards. And there are some less common and also some rare side effects as well. So helpful tips. Well, because we know that you may feel a little bit unwell afterwards, think about what time of day or what part of your week you'd like to have the injection. Perhaps if you do it at night time before bed, you might be able to sleep through the worst part of it. Or 
perhaps instead of doing it on a Monday, if you've got a lot to do during the week, you may be able to move it to a Friday so you can have the weekend at home to recover. And also maybe using some over-the-counter medication like paracetamol to look at managing if there's a little fever or some discomfort. Now over to Capaxone. This is also in that low effectiveness category and it is three times a week. It works as a chemical decoy. So it's a synthetic version of amino acids and amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So we think this works as a chemical decoy and kind of diverts the immune attack away from the myelin, which is that insulation on the nerve and that's how it prevents that damage. There's not too much in terms of pre-treatment screening and monitoring, but again, we're looking at keeping something in the fridge and a bit of logistics around having a routine to do that injection yourself and sharps containers. And there is a potential for scarring or injection site reactions as well over time. With the side effects, you could see something called lipoatrophy, and that is like indentations in the skin. That nearly looks like a bit of a cellulite type thing, so little kind of um, grooves or bumps that can happen over time. And then less common, but good to note and be aware of, is immediate post-injection reaction. This is something that can shortly occur after an injection, and it can give you quite a fright. It, we think it is harmless, but it can cause flushing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, palpitations, it can last a very short time or even last up to half an hour and will go away by itself. But if you do get a fright, it's good to know how to manage that. So do be aware that that can happen. So helpful tips. Well, dosing on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday is really important because it will mean that you're able to keep up with um, a routine and know when you're supposed to be having that injection. Also allowing it to come to room temperature before you inject, that's also really important. And dip, different injection depths for different injecting sites. So moving on to Orbagio now. So when we're looking at Orbagio, as I said, it is no longer available in the brand name. It's only available under the generic name, which is teriflunamide. That is a daily medication and in that low efficacy category as well and it stops immune cells from multiplying. You start at home on a full dose, and in terms of side effects, um, could see some hair thinning and hair loss or something called neutropenia. Neutrophils are another type of white blood cell adjacent to kind of the lymphocyte, which is the main white blood cell involved in MS. Neutrophils sit next to those, and neutropenia is a reduction in those neutrophils. There are some less common and also very rare side effects as well. In terms of helpful tips, we do know that Obagio or teriflunamide is not recommended for pregnancy and uh, could potentially cause harm to a developing uh, baby. So it is very important to use an effective method of contraception during treatment and for up to two years afterwards, if you're of childbearing age and, and a woman, and that two years afterwards um, is relative to how long the drug can stay in your body, but the doctor can help you with an accelerated washout if we need to get that drug out of your body in a hurry. Let's have a look at the fumarate. So there's two types of medications that fall into this category. We've had Tecfidera for quite some time and Vumerity has just come um, to the market. So they are very, very similar in the way that they work. There's just a mild difference. So they have slightly different generic names, but they convert to the same thing inside the body. The Tecfidera molecule is a little bit smaller, so they're able to fit it into one capsule. So you take one in the morning, one at night. Whereas Bumeridae, the molecule is a bit larger, which means that in theory, I think it travels less freely in the body and that contributes to Bumeridae having a little bit uh, less side effects in the discomfort area of things like gastrointestinal upset. So Demerity is supposed to be a little bit more comfortable to be on. Because the molecule is larger, they had to make it into two capsules for one dose. So you're taking two capsules in the morning, two capsules at night. And then there is a difference in the amount of methanol in there. That's only important to note because they think that the methanol is what relates to that gastrointestinal upset. 
So by having nine times less methanol, we expect that you should have a little bit more of a comfortable experience on Vimerity potentially. So we talked about um, the way that they work and you're having one dose in the morning and one dose at night for Tecfidera. In terms of what to expect, we know that the side effects can be worse when starting. And so now we're looking at a titration situation. Titration is where you start on a low dose and slowly increase up. And that can be quite common with a lot of medications, especially in MS. So starting with a lower dose while your body adjusts can help minimize those side effects. And they, the side effects can be worse if you take this medication on an empty stomach. We can also see some flushing. So that would be reddening of the face or body or feeling warm and hot and kind of a burning, itching feeling. And then with that GI upset or gastrointestinal upset, looking at things like nausea, diarrhea, could be vomiting, bloating, cramping. So they're potential side effects. You'll also see under very rare, something called PML. And we'll go into that a little bit later because it relates um, more closely to another medication called Tysabri. So stay tuned and I'll explain that a little bit further later on. Some helpful tips. Well, take it with a full meal because that's going to give a barrier in your tummy and uh, reduce the side effects. So having it with a full breakfast and a full dinner. And there may be some merit to having a higher fat or higher calorie meal. Not an excuse for junk food, um, but potentially that could help in terms of what you're choosing to eat. So something substantial and having that tablet kind of halfway through that meal got a jar of peanut butter there because I have heard people say if they put the capsule inside the, um, like a teaspoon of peanut butter or Nutella or avocado that, that also may help with reducing the side effects and because it's twice a day you might like to set an alarm on your phone or your smartwatch or an alarm clock at home to remember to take it. Aspirin may help with the flushing so reach out to your treating team if you're having any side effects and they can discuss with you whether aspirin would be appropriate to help with that. We've talked about Vimerity, very similar, but two in the morning, two at night. With uh, titration, there is also titration with Vimerity and those side effects might get um, a little bit easier as you go on. Similar side effect profile again to the Tecfidera. And in terms of helpful tips, um, we know that interestingly, they're saying high fat and high calorie meals aren't potentially as good with Vimerity. So there's no need to have it specifically with food. Um, not to say you have to have it on an empty stomach, but it's not the situation where they're saying you must have it with a substantial meal. If you're not tolerating it very well, we can extend that titration period. So reach out to your team if you're really having a rough time at the start and they might be able to extend that for you. And also use a little dosette box. This comes in a bottle of about 120 tablets and so you, capsules, sorry. So you may find that if you're trying to pour them out on your hand, you might get too many, you might drop one. Or another experience could be that you're always putting your grimy little fingers in there to pull them out. So by using a dose set, you're able to um, easily put two in each um, box. And then also it helps with memory because often we go on autopilot for these standard things. And we might think, hmm, did I take my medication this morning? I can't remember. So you can very easily go back and check, okay, yeah, the Monday morning one is empty. I must have taken my tablet. Or you go in at night time to have your Monday night tablets and think, oh gosh, there's still two left this morning. I forgot to take them. It's also handy if you're going away and just need to take one or two doses with you. You're not taking that whole bottle and risking losing all of them. Let's have a look now at the S1P receptors. So these are a class of medications that are very similar in the way that they work inside the body. And so I've put this little diagram here to explain it. So S1P receptors are on the surface of lymphocytes and lymphocytes are the type of white blood cell that's most, I suppose, important that we talk about in terms of multiple sclerosis. And so S1P receptors are on the surface of lymphocytes and they're involved in kind of how the lymphocytes move. And so by these drugs attaching themselves to the surface of the lymphocyte, it stops the lymphocyte from leaving the lymph nodes. 
So it keeps them trapped in the lymph nodes. And if they're not able to float around freely in the bloodstream, then they're not there to potentially cross that blood brain barrier and cause damage. So Jelenia binds to the S1P receptor, one, two, three, four, and five. Zaposia, which also works on relapsing remitting like Jelenia does and works in the same way, doesn't uh, attach itself to the S1P two, three, and four. So it only attaches to one and five. So that's useful to know because with Jelenia, when you take the first tablet, you need to have something called first dose monitoring because it may potentially change your heart rate just for that first dose. And that's relative to the, you can see the S1P3 where it talks about the AV node induction. Whereas Zaposia doesn't attach itself to the S1P3 and therefore is not likely to need that first dose monitoring. So that's kind of a helpful comparison for Jelenia and Zaposia. Mazent is working on secondary progressive MS and um, we can see there it only attaches to S1P1 and 5. So it's either pronounced Jelenia or Galenia, depending on who you're asking, and it's a daily medication. We're now in that moderately effective category. We talked about how this works by trapping the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes, and it is also approved for paediatrics. So we talked about that first dose observation. So for Jelenia, for that first tablet, you will have to go to hospital or a clinic and sit and be monitored. So you'll be monitored for six hours, you might do an ECG and keep an eye on your blood pressure and your heart rate. It can be pretty boring, but they will keep an eye on you for that six hours. You only need to do that for the first tablet because that's the first time the drug binds to that S1P receptor. After that, because you're taking it every day, there's never going to be a time of kind of a brand new connection where that risk could happen again. So once you've started Jelenia, you don't have to worry that that potential side effect could happen later on in the later months or years. It's really just that first time. And also there are some pre-screening tests for things like macular edema. That is a side effect that can happen that involves swelling at the back of the eye. And because that doesn't always cause symptoms, they'll do a test before you start treatment to see how that's looking. And then after you start treatment a couple of months later, just to check if it's happened, because if it does happen, you might not know. Also looking at whether you've been exposed to chickenpox before, because there's a chance that maybe shingles could come later on. So in terms of the side effects here, um, we are looking at potentially being more likely to get some infections because it is an immunosuppressant. So that herpes virus um, can either link to things like cold sores or shingles. And that is, shingles is the reactivation of the virus that causes chickenpox. And shingles itself can start with kind of an awareness or a bit of a pain of one particular part of the body that can then develop into a rash that's usually very painful and blisters, most commonly a band around the torso, but it can come on the face and um, is also accompanied by a general feeling of unwell. So it's, it's quite a, um, an uncomfortable thing that can happen. Also, you'll see basal cell carcinoma. That is a specific type of skin cancer. And then in the very rare, you'll see PML as well, which we will explain a little bit later on. So helpful tips, be sun smart. So one of the things you can do is actually make sure that you're wearing sunscreen. Um, Every day we are recommended to wear sunscreen. The current recommendation for all Australians is to wear sunscreen every single day. So keep up with that recommendation and also get your skin checked and then don't forget to take it. So in terms of daily medication, we need to take it every day. If you forget right when you've just started, you may need to go in for that first dose observation. Um, but later on, it may not be as much of a concern depending on how long you have forgotten your medication for. It is very important that you don't take double doses of medication though. And that's relevant for, for all of these medications we talk about today. If you forgot your tablet yesterday, don't take twice as much today. Um, that will be an overdose, we don't want that. Having a look at Zaposia. We explained the difference between Zaposia and Jelenia. They do work in the same way there. And because of that difference in the S1P receptor situation, you may be able to start this treatment at home unless you've got cardiac history, meaning you need to have that monitoring. 
there is a titration. So you will start on a lower dose and slowly increase until you get to what we call a maintenance dose. And a maintenance dose is what you're going to maintain moving forward. Similar side effect profile to Jelenia, so much the same there. And in terms of helpful tips, again, try to work this into your daily routine. So whether you're setting alerts or reminders and paying attention in that titration period, especially not to forget any, because if you do, you may need to start from scratch. So you should reach out to your team if you forget. Looking at Mazent, so still in the S1P receptor family, trapping the lymphocytes in the lymph glands, but it's for secondary progressive MS and it's a daily medication. Interestingly though, with this drug, they actually do a blood or saliva test to check how well you'll tolerate it because they customise the dose based on your genotype. So very rarely in less than 1% of people, it may be found that you cannot actually metabolize or break down this drug, and so it would not be advised for you. But for the vast majority of people, they'll either be told, I think it's a one milligram dose or a two milligram dose as their maintenance dose. So if you're on this drug, you could actually be on a slightly different dose than someone else on this drug. So they'll do that test beforehand, and then when you start this medication, you do start on a titration and then go on to a maintenance dose. Slightly similar side effect profile to those other drugs that we spoke about as well. And also you'll see here something that says not known. Frequency cannot be estimated from available data. That's exactly what it says in the information that this is a potential thing, but they can't tell you how often it happens. Helpful tips. They recommend this one should be taken in the morning. And again, with titration, we want to pay attention not to forget any and also keep an eye on being sun smart and wearing sunscreen. Now we're moving on to Mavenclad. So this does work a little bit differently. It's actually dosed as per your body weight. And there is a, a small time that you need to take treatment, but it lasts for a longer period of time. So you'll take tablets daily for four or five days in week one. You'll do the same thing again in week five and then no other treatment required for year one. We repeat that in year two, so tablets in week one and week five again, and then no more treatment for year two. In years three and four, you don't need to take any tablets. So you're only taking treatment in years one and two, and it's lasting for four years. The reason you can do that is because in the trial, they did give a group of people medication in years three and four, and they actually didn't come out any better off. So we know that it does have that sustained effect in reducing the number of lymphocytes you have and they gradually grow back over time. You can have more Mavenclad if needed. So occasionally someone may need to be retreated and that can happen upon advice from the neurologist. And then after year four as well, you would be continuing to have assessments to see where you're at and whether you may need treatment again. Because it's dosed per body weight, they are going to pop you on the scales. So that will dictate how many tablets you take each day and whether it's for four or five days. So it's really good to pay attention, get very clear instruction. How many tablets am I taking? Because you may be taking different amounts of tablets on different days and again, totally different to someone else. So it's based on body weight and they will check uh, a few more conditions beforehand. So looking at screenings for HIV and hepatitis. After you start Mavenclad, they'll do a blood test to check that your cell count has dropped, which is what we're expecting. And then they'll check again that it's slightly come back up again. In terms of side effects, looking at potentially those herpes virus infections, so getting cold sores and or shingles, may also get a rash. Reduced lymphocyte count is what we're expecting because we're reducing how many lymphocytes you have. But also we could see that reduced neutrophil count which causes neutropenia. Neutropenia means not enough neutrophils, and that can link in with an increased risk of developing infections. We can see things like a little bit of hair loss as well. So helpful tips. 
again, schedule, because uh, when you're taking treatment, as I said, there's very clear instructions on how many am I taking, on what day and when. So really getting clear um, advice and documenting that. So you have very clear understanding of, okay, today when I wake up, this is how many tablets I'm taking. We also want to consider that you may not feel well during that treatment week. Everyone is different. You may feel okay, or you may feel a little bit off or flat. So if you have the luxury, give yourself some flexibility and some space in terms of maybe working from home if that's a possibility or easing up the social calendar or maybe preparing some meals and just having things available in case you don't feel like you want to run out to the shops and do all your normal things. Now we're moving into the high efficacy category here. So we're looking at Kaisabri, which is an infusion. It is given every four weeks, or every 28 days, so four weekly, but it can actually be extended up to six weeks. At some places they are doing this, so instead of having it every four weeks, could be every six weeks. So it is highly effective. And it's not necessarily a true immunosuppressant because it doesn't reduce how many lymphocytes you have. It's what we call a traffic blocker. So it actually binds to those lymphocytes and stops them from being able to cross that blood brain barrier. So they can't get into the central nervous system. And the central nervous system is the brain, the spinal cord and the optic nerves. And that is where the nerves can be damaged when you have MS. It is also approved in pediatrics as we discussed. So pre-treatment screening, we're looking at this JCV test. So JCV stands for the John Cunningham virus, and it's a virus that is totally unrelated to MS. It's out in the community, and most of us would have been exposed to it. Anywhere between 50 to 70% of us may have come in contact with this virus, and you're unlikely to know because it stays dormant in our body and we keep it under control and it doesn't really cause too much of a fuss. However, if the immune system is then weakened in a particular way, such as going on Tysarbury, then there's a very rare chance that the virus could reactivate. And if it does, it could cause PML, which I'll explain on the next slide. So because of that, they will do a blood test to screen for anti-JCV antibodies, so antibodies that fight against the JCV. So they'll do a blood test and they'll actually send them to Denmark. All Australians get their blood sent over to Denmark for this particular test and then the results come back to tell the doctor uh, a number and that helps the doctor interpret the risk. And so screening will be done to determine whether or not Tysabri might be appropriate and then also once you've started Tysabri, very important to have those tests done, usually six monthly, and very important to continue having MRIs done as well. Tysabri itself takes about an hour, although it can be given a little bit quicker, and there'll be an observation period afterwards, most commonly, to make sure that you haven't had any reactions they're not expecting, and they will check your blood pressure and those types of things when you're having the infusion. With side effects, you might be slightly more likely to get urinary tract infections. And then in terms of less common, severe allergic reactions, and then very rare, we have that PML. So PML stands for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is very hard to say, so we call it PML. PML is a very serious brain infection that can cause serious disability and or death and there is no treatment or cure. So as I said, that JC virus could rarely reactivate and cause this brain infection. And that's why Tysabri wouldn't be suitable for everyone. And why also some people may start on it, but be told they have to change after um, because the blood tests are coming back and the doctor is thinking, okay, I want to change um, you off this drug because that blood result is changing or perhaps being on Tysabri a little bit longer as well as the risk factor. So some helpful tips, hydrate the day before and the morning of, and make sure you have plenty to eat and drink beforehand. These don't relate specifically to Tysabri. This is advice I'm giving because it's an infusion. So if you're well hydrated, 
your blood volume is going to be a little bit higher, your veins will be nice and juicy, and a lot easier for someone to be able to put a cannula, that little needle in you. So it makes it a little bit easier. And then because you're going to be sitting there having this infusion, bring some entertainment. You might like to bring a book or headphones, podcast, gaming device, something to watch, or you might just like to have peace and quiet. I do speak to clients that say, I'm very happy there. None of my kids can find me or bother me. I just sit there in peace. There's no reason why you couldn't drive after having Thai Sabri, but because you're maybe not sure how you'll feel after the first infusion, you might like someone to drive you or consider public transport, for example, if that's something that you normally do, have a think about whether that's appropriate. And someone's going to need access to your arm. So are you wearing long sleeves that can't roll up or have you got a t-shirt or a singlet on where both arms are freely accessible to the nurse? And because you're just going to sit there, you might like something like a zip up hoodie um, where you can easily get one arm out but keep the rest of you quite warm. These infusions are commonly given in infusion centres or infusion lounges or even at the part of the hospital where they have day oncology, so people get come in and have chemotherapy and go home. So you should know where you're supposed to go because it can be a bit stressful. I don't know about you, but when I go to hospital, one of the most stressful things is parking. Where am I parking? Do I have coins for the parking meter? The stress. So do a test run. This is advice I got from an MS clinic nurse. She said, do a test run, find out where I'm gonna park, how long will it take me to get to the hospital from where I park, and where am I supposed to go in the hospital? So that when you have your infusion day, it's just one less thing you're worried about because you're like, I know where I'm going. I've got a good parking spot. I walk in, I know exactly what to do and where to go. Now we're going to have a look at the anti-CD20 drugs. So Ocrevus and Cassimpta are two different drugs that work in such a similar way that you might say, well, what's the difference? So Ocrevus is an infusion that we've had for a couple of years now, and Cassimpta is an injection that you give yourself, and it's quite new to the market. They both target the CD20B cells. So do you remember we talked about the lymphocytes? There's actually two types of lymphocytes, a B cell and a T cell. And so these drugs target the B cell lymphocytes, and in particular, the ones that have this CD20 on them. Cassimpta actually has a better grab onto the cell, I suppose, because it's grabbing on in two areas, what they call the small loop and the big loop. So you can see here in the teal that it's getting one area and the other. So it's got a good grab. Ocrevus is uh, attaching on the large loop only in the orange. So that's really the difference when we're talking about how in the body are these two drugs different. So Ocrevus is a six monthly infusion. So it's an infusion that goes over one day and then you go home and you don't need to have any more treatment for the rest of those, uh, the rest of that time during that six month period. So in terms of screenings, they'll do some screenings beforehand. When you're having the infusion, you'll be there all day and they will do OBS periodically through that time as well. You will get some pre-medication. So when you go into the hospital, before they start Ocrevus, they'll give you some steroids, likely methylprednisolone, and that's to reduce the side effects that you experience from Ocrevus, as well as an antihistamine, which you may know as like um, allergy medication for hay fever, for example, and then also often paracetamol as well. There is a titration. So that first dose you have is actually split in half. So half on day one, and you go home, Go back in on day 15, have another half, and then after that, it's every six months. In terms of side effects, because it is an immunosuppressant, you might be more likely to get some infections, particularly viral infections. So things like upper respiratory tract or the flu, um, and also looking at that cold sore or potentially shingles as well. And there's also an infusion associated reaction that could happen. I want to make it very clear as well that just because these are listed side effects that we're talking about, it doesn't mean you're going to get all of them. It's not a shopping list. You don't get to collect them all, but this is what may happen. So we're not expecting people to get every single thing listed. Possible, but that's not what we're expecting. This is what could happen. 
So with, with these reactions, sorry, we're looking at uh, itchy skin or rash or hives um, and then the other things you can see listed there. That could happen when the infusion is going into your body or up to 24 hours afterwards. So if you're in the hospital having the infusion, you would just pop your hand up, let them know, and they would often pause the infusion, treat the side effects, and then they'll um, restart the infusion, often at a slower rate. And so it's also a good tip to know who am I supposed to call if I go home and I'm not feeling well or I'm having a bit of a side effect so that you can get some advice on how to manage that. So helpful tips again, because it's uh, an infusion, make sure that your arms are accessible. So wearing something like a singlet or a t-shirt and make sure you're well hydrated. You will be in hospital likely all day. The infusion itself takes about three to four hours, but there could be a bit of fuss beforehand and maybe some monitoring afterwards. So have the idea that it could take all day. And so bring some entertainment. They probably do feed you, but no harm in bringing your own snacks, especially if it's something that you might like and a bit of a blanket or a cozy cardigan that you can snuggle into, you might get cold. And a phone charger. No one likes a flat phone battery. So bring a phone charger, maybe an extra long charging cord and something to keep you um, entertained or I suppose something to focus on. We can't take away from how yucky something like this might be having treatment, but we can sometimes tilt the scales back in our favour. So you might like to spend a bit of effort making a little goodie bag for yourself or spending a little bit of money um, on some little treats that you can take in or asking your loved ones to write you a nice little card or buy you a magazine. It's not going to take away from, again, how yucky it is, but it might just slightly change the day. Um, you might even like to have a special routine, like on infusion days, you, know, you go out to your favourite cafe for breakfast, for example. So again, there can be tiny things that you associate with treatment to just make it less of a yucky thing for you. You may also feel a bit flat or fatigued after treatment. Everyone is different, but you might like to plan to either work from home for a week or again, just look at someone else to take the kids to soccer, see what you can do to support yourself in case you don't feel like cooking every night. Um, so think about ahead of time. If I've got treatment coming up, what can I do now as a favour to my future self? Looking at Kasimta, so it works in a very, very similar way we talked about, but it is a monthly injectable drug. So because it's an injectable drug, you're going to be giving it to yourself at home, but it's actually given with a loading dose. So rather than starting small and increasing upwards, it's actually the opposite. We start with a bigger dose and then we get you onto your maintenance. So you will have a weekly injection on week zero, week one and week two. Nothing on week three. And then from week four, you have it monthly. So week four, week eight, week 12, week 16, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes on monthly after that. It's the same dose, it's the same injection, but it's just that for the first three weeks, it's weekly and then monthly after that. There's no uh, recommendation for routine tests, but it doesn't mean your doctor may not ask for them. It also is kept in the fridge as well. In terms of side effects, similar to Ocrevus because they work in similar ways, but because it's an injection, you could have injection related reactions. Most commonly in the kind of 24 hour period after an injection, and particularly after the first one, it may lessen as you go on. And you could also have some injection site reactions as well. A common side effect is a decrease in the blood level of a protein called immunoglobulin, and that helps protect against, protect against infection. So that's why you might be slightly more likely to get some infection. So it comes in an auto injector. So it's a pre-filled um, auto injector pen. Looks kind of like an EpiPen if you've ever seen one of those before and quite similar to this little image I've put here. So this one, you don't need to kind of draw it up and flick the syringe like they do in the movies when they squirt that little bit out the top. It's all pre-prepared for you, but it is in the fridge. And we recommend having it come to body temperature before uh, dosing to make it more comfortable. So you can do that by leaving it out on the counter or you could pop it in your bra against your boobs to warm it up a little bit or even under your arm perhaps. 
but we're certainly not reheating it like in a cup of hot water. We're not putting it in the microwave. We're not reheating it like leftover lasagna. We just need it to gently come to room temperature, but not, it's not getting hot. Have a think about which time of day is best for the injection as well, and also rotate injection sites. So with these injections, uh, but the other ones we spoke about as well, you don't have to use the same spot every time. And sometimes you might like to document which injection sites you've used at which times so that you can um, keep changing or find ones that are more or less comfortable for you. Because it's monthly, we don't want you to forget it. And it's also all on you to remember. So schedule reminders in your phone, your calendar or your diary. You may like to pick a certain uh, date. So even though some months are 28 days, 30 or 31 days, I believe it's okay if you say I'm having my injection on the first of every month. So it's an easy thing to remember. And I think there may even be an app where you can log your doses via the patient support program. And if you don't log your dose, that actually gives you a reminder call. So have a think about um, how to remember this. There's lots of fancy ways to do reminders. I think Google Calendars can even send you emails when you ask them to for automatic reminders. So think about ways that will work for you. Lemtrida, this is an infusion that is highly effective. It does have a very significant effect on the immune system. It kills the immune cells and actually allows them to grow back. And it's given in two treatment courses, one year apart. So in the first year, it's given daily for five days. So you would go into hospital, have your treatment all day and go home and then go back again for five days. In year two, that's for three days. It is given with pre-medication specifically um, or most commonly in the first kind of three days of that treatment week. So steroids, antihistamine, we talked about Panadol and then also some anti-herpes medication as well, potentially. There will be screening beforehand and then once you've started treatment, you'll be having monthly blood and urine tests for five years. So even though you're not having treatment after year two, very important to still have those pathology tests done because the side effects could pop up at any time and they may not have symptoms. So you may think, I feel okay. Why do I need to get getting these tests done? You must. Another thing that's unique with Lemtrida is you may be advised to follow a listeria aware diet. So looking at things like not having soft cheeses or deli meats or bain marie foods, which is very similar to that diet that pregnant women may be advised to follow. So that could be a recommendation from your treating team to do beforehand and a little bit afterwards as well. With Lemtrida, I've written for example in each uh, category here because there are a lot of side effects and they, they simply would not fit on the slide. So for example, there could be infusion reactions, more likely to develop infections, um, could cause thyroid disorders that maybe need medication or surgical intervention, decrease in the white blood cell count, could be some pain, and then also some other autoimmune conditions there. So that's why it's very, um, very important to get those pathology tests done. Hydrate beforehand, again, make it easy for them to cannulate you and think that you may feel okay afterwards, but everyone is different. So have a think about what you could do ahead of treatment so that once you've had your treatment, if you're not feeling 100%, then you're, you're well organized, but you may feel okay. So have some ideas of something nice you can do if you do feel okay. And because we're doing that monthly pathology testing, get a routine going, go to the same place, see the same person every time. It just makes it a lot easier. And even though you're not necessarily having treatment after year two, make sure that you do continue with your MRIs and your neurologist appointments. That's very important. And especially with all these medications, always important to continue with your reviews. We're going to have a little look at stem cell therapy because it is a disease modifying treatment in, in the treatment of MS. It is not common, but we'll do a little bit of an overview so you can get an understanding of it. All stem cell therapies, well, a lot of them can be different. And so in MS, we specifically talk about AHSCT or autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant. 
long, long title, what does that mean? So we're talking about stem cells, which are the body's raw materials, and then they are taken, so transplanted, autologous from one person and then back into the same person. So taking out someone's own blood stem cells, so stem cells that are grow into those blood kind of immune cells and taking them out of someone's body and then putting them back in. So what does that look like? There are different regimes and protocols and there's also different types of stem cells. So not all stem cell therapy is the same, not all stem cells are the same, but we're mentioning AHSCT. And so this is an example of what a protocol could look like for this specific um, stem cell therapy. So the first thing is to administer a medication that is actually going to tell the body to release the stem cells from the bone marrow so that they can be collected from the person. So they're popped in the freezer. And then we see for step four, you're actually given chemotherapy that is either going to entirely wipe out your immune system or partially wipe out your immune system. And that is the part that is actually treating the MS, I suppose, because it's that immune system that has that faulty memory that means it continues to go in and cause damage. So by wiping out that immune system, we're getting, really, getting rid of that so that we can grow a new healthy immune system. So the purpose of those stem cells is so that we can regrow a healthy immune system. So the stem cells aren't necessarily treating the MS, uh, but it's actually allowing you to survive the chemotherapy. And then step six would be to have lots of medical support and care whilst you recover from that. In terms of the side effects, I certainly could not fit them all on one slide and they can differ depending on what regime you're having, which chemotherapy you're having and how strong it is. For example, we're looking at being highly susceptible to infection. So you might need to isolate in hospital in isolation. Um, previous infections can reactivate. You could develop other autoimmune conditions and chemotherapy itself has side effects like fatigue, weakness, loss of appetite as well. There can be an increased risk of bleeding and bruising. So I've heard of people bleeding from the bowel, for example. Your MS symptoms could temporarily become worse you may lose your hair. Chemotherapy, this particular type of chemotherapy can be toxic to the testicles and ovaries, so it could lead to infertility and it could also cause early menopause in females. Malignancies is cancer and there also rarely is a risk of death. Um, that does depend on kind of what protocol you are having, but it is important to note that it is a very serious treatment and not undertaken lightly. For that reason, it is not recommended for everyone. This is not an appropriate treatment for everyone with MS. It is more appropriate for people living with very active inflammatory MS. MS that is not responding to the other treatments we have. It is available in Australia at some MS clinics, either under a clinical trial where they're very closely monitoring and also learning uh, what type of people and MS does this suit best and how effective is it? And also outside of clinical trial um, at some particular clinics via a very strict eligibility. So as I said, not all stem cell therapies are the same. So it doesn't mean if somewhere is offering stem cell therapy that it's this, they are different. And there are many safety concerns that can be very serious. So if you're interested or you have questions, speak to your specific neurologist about whether this would be appropriate for you because as I said, it is not appropriate for everyone. So lastly, we're looking at uh, changing medication potentially. When might you need to change your MS medications? You may have new or uh, worsened symptoms. So you might find there's new lesions or relapses that are occurring. You may find that the side effects of the drug are unbearable or they're worse than the doctor expected and so they're thinking you know what I actually don't think this is a right fit for you. You might have lifestyle changes perhaps you're on a twice a daily medication and that's not suitable for you because you've got shift work and so twice daily medication is just not going to work in your routine or other changes in health. Um, perhaps you're wanting to plan a pregnancy for example that is something that we'd like to know ahead of time so we can come up with a plan. And then better options. As we saw right at the start, new drugs do become available. 
So let's have a look at side effects. So it's really important to know what to expect with side effects and also what to do about them. So you should be asking questions like, what are the commonly reported side effects? And what should I do if I experience them? Is there a certain amount of time where you think they'll ease or is there a certain time frame where if they continue, I should do something about it and give you a call? So get some information from your MS nurse, your neurologist, and also look at other resources in terms of the GP or your pharmacist, or if that drug has a patient support program. You should be having regular reviews. So I've said that a few times. Make sure you are continuing with your neurologist. So do review side effects. Should they have subsided by now? Is there anything else I can do to manage them? And a little bit on decision making and, and shared decision making really between you and your team. So things to consider when you're trying to choose the right treatment for you. The likely disease course. We certainly can't stare into a crystal ball and think what your MS is going to be like in the future and, and know for sure. That's not something we're able to do. But there are some potential factors that your neurologist might be able to consider to give you some idea of what they might be expecting. Also have a think about the treatment goals. Why are you going on treatment? What are you hoping that this does for you? And how do you picture yourself as a little old person? What mobility are you looking at? What kind of activities and, and what do you, um, your future plans look like? By knowing where you want to end up, that can give you an idea of what's required to get there. And so that might help you again decide which treatment is the most appropriate. You may have existing health conditions which are relevant to consider, and also your values and beliefs, which are different for everyone. Also have a think about your lifestyle and your access to healthcare. Are you living regionally or perhaps remotely, or are you living really close to town? How are you going to be able to manage side effects and, and what supports do you have? And are you able to really commit to those monitoring requirements? We talked about one of the drugs having monthly testing that you have to do for a number of years. Is that something you'll be able to do? And also a little bit about your future plans. Are you, are you planning on traveling overseas for a long time? Are you planning to have a baby? These are things that are good to have um, in the conversation with your doctor. And finally, I have this little vote card here because when I speak to people, I very rarely, if ever, have heard someone say, oh, this drug is the one for me. I think that looks perfect. I'm really excited about it. That one just looks like a really good fit. Most often, they all look a bit yucky and a bit frightening. And so sometimes if you are faced with making a decision from a couple of drugs, it can help by starting with the most worst. Um, that might not be the right way to say it, but start by looking at which is the least desirable and kind of work backwards. Sometimes that can be helpful as well, but shared decision making is a really big thing to consider. So do make sure you have lots of communication with your treating team about that. That's all for me, Pete. I think I'm going to throw back to you. Thank you, Jane. Um, a great presentation. So I'll just run quickly through a few of our services now. So we're here at MSL, so we based at MS alone, and we offer, we offer services to people with MS um, in ACT, New South Wales, Tasmania, and Victoria. And we offer services such as uh, allied health. So we have physiotherapists, uh, exercise physiologists, occupational therapists. Um, we offer NDIS support, um, we offer employment support, financial support, um, and and a service that I know many people really love. Uh, it's a peer support program, so um, I suggest, highly suggest you utilise that um, if you're looking to speak or listen to people um, in a similar um, boat to you. So. Just onto our resources now, we, we also offer a number of resources. So we do live webinars uh, sort of monthly, sometimes twice monthly, and um, we are releasing podcasts also monthly or twice monthly. Um, but we also have a, a very um, large webinar and podcast library that you can access whenever you like. So um, I suggest you sort of have a look through those because um, any sort of topic that relates to MS or, or wellbeing you can think of, we have generally covered. And we also do 
um, other events such as Facebook Live events. So um, certainly follow us on Facebook and Instagram at MS Get Involved. Um, and lastly, just um, if, if you do need to contact us, please contact us at MS Connect at 1800-042-138 or at msconnect at ms.org.au. MS Connect are the gateway to any queries you have, um, any services that you might want to access, um, anything that you need, um, they are the people to contact. They are amazing. They will be able to help you. So I just want to say a final thank you to Jane. That was a very informative and engaging presentation. And um, thank you for everyone for listening and we'll see you next time. And we'll go away by itself. But if you do get a fright, it's good to know how to manage that. So do be aware that that can happen.